Hey, true believers, do you love politics? Do you love comic books? Well, superhero politics is for you. Combines the comical nature of politics and the political nature of comic books. Join us, like, share, and experience the world of comics and politics in a way that you never have before. This is superhero politics. And I'm your host, Michael Holmes. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Superhero Politics. This is your host, Michael Holmes, and this is a very special episode because what you guys are going to be hearing is the audio from uh, the fan panel that Superhero Politics Podcast conducted at GalaxyCon Raleigh two weeks ago. Um, just how this happened, a little backstory. Um, uh, GalaxyCon comes to Raleigh every year, same time in July, and uh I'm always busy, like I'm always traveling or I'm always, always doing something that I never have a chance to go. And so obviously um, this year, you know, by this podcast being around for a while, uh, I really interested in, in seeing if possibly we could get to become part of the convention. And so I reached out to the organizers and they said, hey, let's talk about it. We did a you know really quick uh, Zoom and they said, well, we'll get back to you. And you know, really at that point I was like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is Galaxy Con. Like they're, they're really not going to, you know, really do anything with this. And so, uh, to my surprise, they did, they came back and they approved the panel and I went down and, um, you know, just with very low expectations about attendance and, you know, over the course of the time waiting, uh, I saw, you know, a few people started, started to pick up a little bit, you know, two and three and four. Uh, and the next thing you know, it was up to 20 and then it was up to 28 and 30. And so I looked, I was like, wow, it's 30 people who have, um, you know, saved this on their to-do list at the convention. Uh, and so I got in and got set up. And then I realized, I looked up and I was like, oh my God, it was like a hundred plus people in the room and uh, people were standing. And so really great and great engaged crowd, lots of laughing, lots of really cool questions. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to play the audio for you. And what you're going to hear is the presentation that we did. And then the Q&A from the, uh, the attendees at the, at the panel. And so if there's any questions that you guys have sparked from this, please feel free to email us at uh, superheropolitics uh, at gmail.com. You can follow us and see the uh, video of the panel on our YouTube channel. And you can also follow us on all social media Facebook, um, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Uh, you can see all of that there and follow all of that there. And so, guys, you can contact us and DM us through our social um, or uh, email us uh, directly. So I really want to thank you guys for all the support, uh, the downloads, and everything that you guys uh, have done supporting the podcast over the last couple of years. And it's growing because of you. And so we just thank you so much. And so sit back and enjoy um, this really cool uh, opportunity that we had uh, as a podcast team here. And uh, just remember, uh, you don't have to be superhuman to be a superhuman. That's our motto. And so we'll see you next time. Thanks. So you guys be gentle. This is my first panel ever. So you guys be gentle. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is my little pandemic baby that I'm, I'm debuting here. Um, in isolation, this idea came to me to do. So I bought a mic off Amazon and here I am three years later at a con. So, hey, anything can happen, right? Okay, so I don't know what the time is, but we'll go ahead and get started. So um, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Holmes. Uh, this is Superhero Politics Podcast. And just like I was just, thank you so much. Just like I was saying earlier, um, I had this idea during the, during the pandemic. I was talking to a friend um, about the state of the country. And, you know, she couldn't believe what was going on. And I said, well, you know, there's comic book references to that. And so the reason why uh, superhero politics is born is I'm a veteran of politics. I've been in it since I was 15, worked on my first political campaign when I was 15 years old. 
Uh, I've collected more than 80,000 and traded more than 80,000 comic books in my life. And so early on, I noticed the um, parallels between what was happening in comic books and what was happening in real life and vice versa. And so um, I am an elected official. I am actually a politician. I'm uh, in office right now in High Point, North Carolina. I serve on city council. I was elected in 2019. So therefore, this is Bureau Positive. Thank you. I am up, I'm up for re-election this year, so uh, homesforhighpoint.com if you want to check out my campaign. But um, I, uh, as you can see, have loved comic books my whole life and uh, have been working in politics my whole life because I believe that if there's one superpower that everyone has, it's the ability to vote and, fo- and, and to affect change and to move our democracy. So, um, But just like everything, in this country, we are super divided. Things are super toxic in and, and, and every every topic that we discuss seems to go the route of political discourse and into the cesspool of what our politics is today. So when we talk about our, the latest Marvel film or whether it's secret invasion or whether it's um, Wakanda forever, or whether it's uh, the, the guardian series or whether it's the flash, everything has a political bent and immediately someone will always say, I hate how political comics are. Now, like, like I hate how I hate how political comics are now. And I'm just like, if you're just now realizing poli- that comics are political, reading is fundamental and it's not fundamental to you because your comprehension is a little bit on the slower side because comics have been political since the very first comic strip was born. And so in about 1700 or something like that, political satire came out and that was uh, essentially a, a comic strip. And it pervade, it um, uh, showed a political message. It was propaganda. Prop- comics were used in Germany for propaganda. It's been used time and time again to convey political messages. And so, you know, you look here, you see Superman with Ronald Reagan. And then also you see the, the very racist 1932 Max Fleischer Superman where he's choking a very caricature uh, drone Asian guy. And it was super racist back in the day where, you know, the, the black people had like really big pronounced lips and bones and huge noses. And it was super racist, but it was also political propaganda. And then you see, obviously, Captain America and the Red Skull. I mean, you can't get any more propagandistic than that. And so uh, there was even a series called the Super Presidents where a few of the presidents were crime fighters. And so if you're just now coming to the realization that comic books and politics are intertwined, uh, I suggest taking a reading comprehension course. But for me, uh, I'm uh, 50 years old. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s reading comic books. And early on, the, 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 some of the seminal moments that I really realized that comics had a political vent was Super Friends, they, God bless them. God bless Hanna-Barbera. They tried so hard <laughs> for representation. I mean, they tried so hard. I mean, Apache Chief, good Lord. Like, try to run that one today, right? Uh, Black, Black Vulcan. And I'm trying to figure out why every, com- where every superhero has Black in it and almost every Black superhero has electric powers. Like, stop stereotypes. Like, we can, like, we're not just fast and have electricity, guys. Like, come on, let us do something else. <laughs> And then, you know, we've got Samurai here with the top knot and uh, you've got El Dorado with this uh, very stereotypical Mayan type deal. But it's they tried to they tr- their intentions were good because they really tried to make sure that little kids like me who grew up loving comic books but didn't see themselves represented in comic books. They didn't see themselves. And so they tried to do that. They were just very, very misguided in how they did it. And so. Um, my first, the comic book, uh, the first comic book I ever purchased that I really got into besides the Superman truth, justice in American way was the trial of the flash and like, um, flash and, and, and Eobard Thawne, they're, they're, they're racing around. He's going to try to kill Linda Park and flash snaps his neck. And I'm like, well, he, he did everything he could, you know, like that was good. But then it was justice, right? Like he killed someone. And so he, as a hero, had to stand trial. And it's just like, wow, this is a real thing about how power 
is held accountable. It's a real thing. Um, and then the first time, honestly, like you look at the, the issues of race and um, you look at X-Men and the allegories between the civil rights movement and, um, and mutant rights. And then the first time I ever saw the N word uh, written in, in, in print was Kitty Pride. And she said it quite a few times. I was, I'm worried about Kitty. Like she said it a few times in the books, but, um, but yeah, those are the first times when you really got the sense that, that life was leading art and, and art was leading life. And so um, comics have always been on the leading edge. They've always been there. <laughs> um, not only just in the sense of popular culture, but also um, fighting for representation of marginalized groups. Um, the, the, whether it's women, right, women's rights, making sure that women have, um, you know, positive representations. I mean, honestly, I don't know how we got the, got through having every comic book, black canaries in fishnets and heels and a bustier fighting crime. Like Batman's in armor. <laughs> like he's in armor and she's in a bustier and fishnets. Like, Something is, a, something is a miss here. And so you look at how uh, women, uh, minorities are portrayed at one point, almost every origin story of the black character uh, in comics was a street kid who got saved by, you know, some white billionaire and, and given a chance to, to better their lives. And so not having these representations of, you know, positive uh, female figures and, and uh, positive affirmations of, African Americans in our society, um, that was because the rooms and the writers didn't reflect the characters that they were writing. And so this is why, you know, folks like Dwayne McDuffie coming along and developing, you know, static shock in that universe and having one that is reflective of the the genre and the culture and the people who write it has been so important. And so comics have touched on everything from women's rights to religion. I mean, you've got you know, uh, Kamala Khan, and you've got Lucifer represented in, in comic books. You've got the source, the one above all, you know, Nightcrawler's a devout Christian. You know, you've got so many times where uh, politics and religion and other aspects come into comic books, and they actually have a place where we can have a, uh, a, a, a conversation about those. But just like everything else in our society today, it gets drugged down. Like, if you've ever been in the comment section of like a YouTube video, it's like the bar scene in Star Wars, right? It's just like, a, it's like the, a, it's a cesspool. And so you can't really comment on how you feel about something without somebody throwing in, you know, uh, you know, let's go Brandon or, you know, Trump 2024 or something like that. But here's the thing, like this is supposed to be the space where we can imagine anything is possible. Like you're you're supposed to be able to say, well, here's this super powered alien that came to, to Earth and now he's a hero saving everybody. But he just can't be black or gay or <laughs> transgender, like literally, literally shape shifting alien, but he can't be trans. You know, like it just it doesn't make sense because somebody's going to be offended because they're not centered in the politics. And so everything that I've ever it's almost like. You know, you know how the Simpsons always predict stuff like comic books is they, they've done that. Like I remember like the legacy virus uh, and the amazing virus in, in D.C. and Marvel. And what do we have in 2019? <laughs> we had a pandemic like with a crazy virus. And, you know, and then we had, you know, obviously the nationalistic things like um, every comic took on 9-11, every hero villain everyone was in you know that at the ground zero in new york and it was those nationalist um undertones that came forth in the writing like it reflected popular culture and it galvanized us to some extent but you know nothing ever really lasts long because we go back to our respective ideological corners and so you know um for us for me uh particularly speaking as an african-american male like i have I didn't see really my first real super superhero till John Stewart in about the the 70s and then Storm came along and then uh, I really got into Black Panther and so I really started to, I didn't really see those and then 
um, as we got later into the 80s and 90s, it started to be a little bit more prevalent that I saw myself um, in, in comics. And that's the one thing about politics that a lot of people um, that we're fighting today. We're fighting to make sure that we maintain representation. We're trying not to push people back into the closet. We're trying to make sure accurate history is being taught. We're trying to make sure that kids have an opportunity to be able to learn about our history and then make choices for themselves. But because we're so divided, we're trying to rewrite history. I just did an episode, um, latest episode on the Flash movie and how Barry goes back in time and he tries this flashpoint, he tries to reset that. And we look at the legislation that's just passed, we look at Supreme Court justice decisions, and they're rolling back 50 half centuries of precedent. Um, They're trying to rewrite the civil rights era, the VRA, Voting Rights Act provisions four and five got gutted. You got the Dobbs decision that rolled back row. You just had affirmative action roll back. And so they're essentially trying to undo the civil rights era. And if they get their hands on it, they're going to undo the new deal when, when it comes to um, social security and Medicare. And so they're trying to undo like the last century of political progress. And so when we talk about reality warping and, and going back in time and resetting things, it's not just in comic books, like literally through political power, you're able to rewind and re and erase people and all the progress that they've been able to make. And so um, this is why, honestly, as a, as a legislator, as someone who's worked on more than 50 campaigns in my life, I understand how important it is to be able to make sure that people don't lose the power to affect their communities. And so uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. But, but, it's, but, but comic books are so pivotal in how young people are able to feel themselves represented in our society. I mean, you think about this. The first, the first openly gay um, character in comics was North Star in, uh, in X-Men. And then we've got, um, now we've got trans, um, you know, represented on TV, uh, Dreamer, Natalie Maines played Dreamer uh, on the Supergirl as a, as a trans uh, woman. And then, you know, this is the one that really set people ablaze. John Kent came out as bisexual, like, oh, my God, I, you know, and there was a there was one of the super folks who was, you know, they played Superman. I mean, I don't know how y'all feel about him, but he came out and said, Superman can't be gay. Um, Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah. And he said, Superman can't be gay. And I was like, dude, he's not real. (laughs) Like, he's not real. He can literally be anything like he can fly to the end of to the end of the universe and you worried about he can't be gay. Like it's really the sad part about it is that we can't imagine because we have we're so ideologically arrogant that we can't imagine that even the characters that uh, are portrayed, they have to be exactly like us or we're offended or everything's woke. I am so tired of hearing that damn word. Like it's a noun and a verb and woke. Like every single thing, every single time you hear something, it's woke legislation, it's woke judges, it's woke this. And we don't even understand what it means. And we're actually making laws and we're affecting popular culture and we're fighting against artistry and creativity because we think that it's somehow going to uh, change our kids. I'm going to tell you right now, I grew up on Looney Tunes and I ain't never dropped an anvil on anybody's head. All right. Like, you know, I I've never, you know, tried to solve my, you know, like shoot a 12 gauge shotgun in my brother's face to see if his head would spin around. I didn't do any of that. And I mean, think about all the things that we witnessed as at at Looney Tunes, like, you know, everybody dressed in drag, like Bugs Bunny was in drag every episode. And Jesus Christ, Pepe Le Pew was rapey. Like he was just like a (laughs) like he was like sexually assaulting everybody and like we didn't all grow up to like become like you know like assaulters like we didn't happen and we watch this every day so the idea that we can't disseminate information and have it not change who we are fundamentally is just weird and so 
you know, we're having this conversation about representation and um, comic books, is, they're fighting a good fight because everywhere else in our country, lawmakers are fighting to push us back. And so if we don't have some medium, some platform to be able to say to kids, it's okay. You're, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a good person. If we don't have that, if kids can't see themselves reflected, then we're going to take a step back, a generation back. And so, um, you know, it's, but there's always backlash. Like you remember like in, in Asia, when black Panther debuted, I see you in the back. What kind of forever, my brother? Uh, I see Black Panther in the back. And so when when it debuted in South Korea and China, they they covered up Chadwick Boseman's face because they didn't want to show a black character. This is what you see on the right is the American release photo. And what you see on the left is what they showed in Asia is what they showed in China and South Korea. They didn't show Halle Bailey, little, little the Little Mermaid. They didn't show that because she was n- not the typical white Ariel. And so, like, even now, like, as representation happens, this is Bitterroot. It's a really great um, indie comic. And they just recently uh, did a Juneteenth episode, and it caught flack and backlash. I mean, Juneteenth is the reckon, uh, recognizing the days that the last slaves in this country got their freedom two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And Bitterroot, it, there's now a national flag, and Bitterroot did a story on it. And I mean, even now, you know, My Adventures with Superman, which is a really cute little anime style story, they racially swapped Jimmy Olsen, right? He's now a brown kid. And every single time that you see comments on it it's like well why did you have to change him well why the hell not you know what what's it matter if jimmy olsen is brown it doesn't it wouldn't matter if superman was brown it didn't matter is because you know it's a character it's superman is a mantle you know there's a bunch of different um superman out there that that you can talk about whether it's calvin ellis or val zod or anybody else that you can do that you can talk about Superman can be anybody. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some characters that I think there's such that the aspects of their their makeup and their origin are so seminal that I don't think you should mess with. Like, I honestly would really oppose anybody changing Magneto's backstory. Like, I'd hate that. Like, I'd really hate that. I mean, because, you know, if as a as a survivor of the Holocaust, it is it is just pivotal to who he is. Now, I don't give a damn about. Charles Xavier, like you, you can be anything like, you know, he can, he can be Kenyan. I don't really care, but Magneto, you, you have to keep that. Like that is a huge part of who that character is and how they came to be. So, you know, for me, I just say like, as you continue to dig into politics, as you continue to dig in, think about those communities. Think about when you have conversations with your families and friends, who, who you can have and stand up for. The motto of our podcast is you don't have to be superhuman to be a superhuman, right? You can be good to somebody. You can be good to people. You have the power to be positive because here's the thing. Like if we don't stay vigilant, some crazy shit can happen. Like really, like really. I mean, honestly, I, the, this was the, Trump was the reason this poly, this, this podcast actually took off. I'm going to tell you guys a story. So when I was talking to my friend about it, about how, you know, politics often is reflected in comic books, I said, you know, she said to me, like, hey, I can't believe we elected this guy. I said, well, you know, there's comic book precedents, right? Like Lex Luthor um, became president in in Superman comics. I said, but the difference is, like, he divested from LexCorp. You know, like, he at least, like, can you imagine, like, being, can you imagine being less ethical than a comic book supervillain? Like... (laughs) Like, can you like literally can you imagine being less ethical? Like, you know, like Trump didn't even stop running his business out of the Oval Office. And so Lex at least had the good sense to be worried about emoluments clauses. But, you know, that's so that's how funny it is. And like you look at like how Trump literally saw Barack Obama as this Superman that he had to take down 
so much so that he ran for president to do it. And so it was really life reflecting art. And so um, that's kind of how we got here, folks. And what I what I want to do with the remainder of our time is really open up the floor for questions. <laughs> I'm glad y'all got that, man. I'm glad y'all got that last pen. Like y'all my people. I am home. Like I am home. I'm glad y'all got that last that last slide. So um, questions. Anybody want questions? Come, please come come forward. I think there's a mic right here. I want to make sure that you guys. My my guy, top notch, top notch, top notch. My guy, top notch. I love it. Yes, sir. I did have a question about like the yep. racial swap for yep. Johnny Storm and yep. the whole, well, the recent ish Fantastic Four, and I kind of was like a little conflicted about it. Yeah, yeah. Like his origins. Yeah. So I kind of want to know like what you were feeling about him just being racially swapped while his sister was still Caucasian. Yeah, I, I, I think, Caucasian. I think in that, I think they really wanted Michael B. Jordan as an actor to carry that because he was such a popular actor, but the script was so bad. And like it just it, the script was so bad there was no like you could have had like you could have had like Lawrence Olivier in those those roles and, you, and it wouldn't have saved it like it was a really strong cast but I think what they tried to do was they tried to modernize it they tried to bring it up and use the power of a very popular actor to carry that film but you there's there's only so much you can do with the source material before you right. lose people. And like honestly, what they did to Doctor Doom in that film was tragic. Oh, God, it was God. it was tragic. It was abomination. The only thing I hate more than what they did to Doctor Doom in that movie was what they did to the Mandarin in Iron Man Three. Oh, That's the only thing I hate more. That's the only thing I hate more. It's the only thing that's more unforgivable than what they did to Doctor Doom in the Fantastic Four movie. Yeah. So um, I think overall, I think he played the character well. And to be honest with you, just a brash kind of, uh, you know, cocky type of a dude. That's just who Johnny Storm is. He's a daredevil. He's a hothead. And so that's reflected in the powers that he gained from the from the cosmic radiation. And so um, they tried it. It just didn't work. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, I don't watch that film ever. <laughs> so if that tells you if that tells you how I feel about it, I don't ever watch that film. And if someone gave that to me uh, as a gift we would no longer be friends, but um, that's how I feel about it. They tried it. It was a, it was a, it was a good effort, but it just, it just didn't fly. Right. Yeah. Thanks bro. Thank you. Absolutely. Great, great costume. Man. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is surrounding like the history surrounding mm-hmm. how politics is often interacted with art. Cause I remember because going back to how you mentioned politics and comics, um, even then propaganda um, in the form of politics going back to the 1700s. I remember watching a little video talking about um, Georgian Mm -hmm. um, fashion and they did a propaganda and propaganda was about that where women had those elaborate wigs. um, They um, talked like if the naval battle was done by the British Navy, the women would have ships done Mm -hmm. on their hair and that sort of thing. Um, and I wanted to know how far this goes back. Cause when I was thinking about it, I, I'm a very big Shakespeare fan, sure. but even then I understood that some of it was questionable. Like if you look at Othello, I, Othello is a great character. Um, mm-hmm. and, and no one really knows why Iago really went after him, yeah. but a lot of people just assume that Iago was probably racist and there are racist allegations against Othello, yeah. that's one of the reasons why Desdemona's father doesn't sure. want her sure. marrying him, but there are like other racial, um, there are a couple of other racial characters where the race is is either included or it's implied. Mm-hmm. And for those other cases that I found, yeah. none of them were like racially positive. They mm-hmm. were really racially negative. So yeah. um, a, the same for Jews in The Merchant of Venice. Yeah. So um, my question to you is, how far do you think this conversation could really go back if we wanted to look at art in general? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think as far as the ability for people to communicate through written 
word or art, I think it goes back that far. Um, when you like the, the one thing that we have now, I mean, we've we've had this pendulum, right, where we had to draw things because we didn't have photos. And then we had photos that could capture lifelike images. And now we have AI that can create lifelike images. And so now what what we look at is the power to shape opinions. Right. We look at the power to change reality. So when we think about folks like Franklin Richards and we think about folks like Mad Jim Jaspers and we think about those folks who carry like this reality warping power to be able to change reality, Wanda Maximoff, like to be able to to change reality as they see fit. This is what we have now with the ability to caricaturize folks in written and art. Right. And so we want to shape people's opinions of what we think. Like you think about uh, Othello and Iago, like it wasn't hard because Othello being a more being a darker skin folks, you you're automatically folks were afraid of, well, I mean, his stature and everything, his voice, his power. And so it wasn't easy. It wasn't hard to make folks afraid of him. You just had to sow a little bit of doubt. And so this is what you do when you control the, the, the power of the pen, right? When you can write things about folks, when you can uh, present folks in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way, like how they used to draw Jews uh, back in the day, darker skin, very, you know, very menacing type looks, and it made people afraid of them. And so as long as people have had opinions and as long as people were, were able to perceive information, the ability to change people's opinion through art and comics has existed. And so it can go back as far as being able to put pen to paper. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Chris. Hey, Chris. Uh, I do think it's interesting we brought up Othello, and ironically, the best rendition of him ever was Lawrence Olivier. Absolutely. Like absolutely. Face, right? That's like, hey, man. Hey, absolutely. Funny. Um, but the uh, the thing that I wanted to bring up is I had an experience. I just kind of want your thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, so when I'm looking at comics, right, and I'm seeing characters be drawn, yeah, it drives me nuts when artists put the same generic face on every character, yeah. right? There's no effort made yeah. um, sometimes, and and you see uh, you see all sorts of times. A really good example of this is Psylocke. Yeah. being drawn with the same face as every other character, yeah. right? And, and yet she's supposed to be Asian. Um, well, she's actually transracial. Well, you know, you think about it. Betsy Braddock started out as a British woman. She's and they, not in the Betsy Braddock body. So right. She's supposed to look Asian. Exactly, exactly. So, um, I had an experience, and, and so, you know, to me, I thought, okay, well, this makes sense. If I'm doing a jam piece or something like yeah. this at a con, I love, I love buying art or getting a commission done. Right. If I talk to somebody that shares that background, yeah, they're going to be able to capture the yeah. essence of those ethnicities and the details. Right. Like I, I remember seeing a, a version of Psylocke that David Nakayama did, mm -hmm. and he's from Hawaii, right? Yeah. And so tons of Asians, right? And so, yeah. um, and I remember as I was putting together this jam piece, there was a, an artist that I talked to. The guy was a black guy. Yeah. Um, and I made a comment about him adding Storm. Um, and I thought that he would be able to capture Storm really well. Yeah. And uh, he took some offense to that. Yeah. And I was I was kind of surprised. Um, and I, I, I just kind of felt like it was this moment where it was kind of like, you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, and you just, sometimes with these political issues within society and culture um it just seems like there's no way to get the right answer yeah. even when you tr when you try to be sincere and yeah. so i wanted to tee, tee you up with that mm -hmm. um and then one other thought um is do you have any issue with the fact that with a lot of the race swaps in in characters throughout pop culture mm -hmm. that it always seems to be that the black actors are replacing redheaded characters. Oh my god, I've heard yeah. I've heard this. Who are, who are more genetically rare than folks that are black, right? Like redheads only make up point only make up two percent of the population. Hey, I have I thank you for that. Thank you for both those questions. That was uh, the question I've been waiting for. Yeah. Like actually I'll I'll take that one first. Like honestly, I think I think there is um an un I think it's an I think there's a a kind of an unspoken like what wh who who's the last group that we can pick on right 
like who's the who's the last group that we can pick on? Like we can't go after you know, like we can't necessarily visibly go after black, black people or or Jews or uh, so who's the group that we can pick on? And I think that yeah, and I think the I think the idea is that there's been so few black characters, um, and there's and and for some reason there was a dearth of red headed characters, like a lot of them, like you know, like like Jean Grey, and it, it was so many redheaded characters. Like, well, you're not gonna miss one or two if they if they go right. Like, you're not gonna miss one or two. And so I think what's happening now is that we're so hypersensitive to things like that that if we have a character that we've traditionally traditionally followed and they race swap them, it's like, hey, you're taking it from me. You know, and so we don't look at the totality of it. Look, I I certainly um, am for creating new characters. I think it keeps the industry fresh. I think it keeps the genre fresh. I think it allows for uh, the writers to be able to expand their creative minds to come up with new power sets and new scales and things of that nature. Like, I, I really think that's what should happen. But I think in terms of time frame, I think they don't want to do it i think it takes so long to get a character to print and into the public consciousness they don't want to take the time to do it so it's so much easier to take a character that exists with a with a backstory and just swap them like you remember like wallace west like you remember y'all like y'all remember when wallace west came out and everybody was like well damn y'all took wally another redhead right and like now he's black and so um i think it's the time that it takes to get a character into the public consciousness that they don't want to do. So it's easier to race swap. Um, now um, your earlier question. And I, if you want about people drawing yes. characters, the character race, yes. not being able to feel like you can find the right balance. Right. And I think what happens is that artists are very temperamental and they say, well, look, I should, <laughs> yeah, for lack of, yeah, artists are very temperamental and they don't want to be pigeonholed. Right. Like, I'm a black artist. I'm a black. I'm an artist who happens to be black. I'm not a black artist. And so I should be able to draw any character if I had the skill to do it. Now, to your point, I think the issue is when you run into um, folks who are not surrounded by a community to give them guidance. Because honestly, like I just read a what if where Miles Morales becomes Thor. And it sounded like a black sportation film. Like Jive, Turkey, Sucker, like, you know, it was awful. And I was like, there was no black people in the room. There was no black people in the writer's room. Like, there's no way this could, would have gotten past black people. Didn't he say about the power of my faith? Yeah, the power of my faith. Like, he literally, yes, it was that awful. It, yeah, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, there was, no, there was nobody in the room to be able to do that, to be able to, to, to proof that. And say, look, you know, we we don't we don't say that, bro. Like we don't talk like that. Like, but in the sense of um, when you're talking about representation visually, you need to have folks who understand the nuances of how a race looks. Because you would have thought the only hairstyle black people had was either bald or a shag, like for the longest time. Like because the folks who were drawing black people couldn't understand the nuance of black hair. And so, like, if you guys have seen, like, the pictures that I've shown of myself here, you can see, like, that's my secret identity. I can change my hair really quickly. So, like, I go from the fade to braids. Like, and so that's one thing that's nuanced in our community is, like, our hair. And when you don't have folks in the room, you miss that. And it alienates readers from that community because you're like, yo, like, we either have an afro or we're bald. Or, you know, we have very tiny eyes or very, very big eyes, you know. And so it's not it's the nuance that I think um, is not there if you don't have folks in the room. So, so do you think that it would be considered discriminatory if somebody that's an editor in chief of Marvel yeah. is assigning characters that have their own books, people like Sam Wilson and yep. Miles Morales, yep. and they're assigning them to black Hispanic artists? Um, you think that they would get backlash on that and say, well, why do you only give these characters to a black artist? Yeah. And so I think I think in a way um, there are a lot of there, there are a lot of folks who work on every book. Right. So I think your team has got to be diverse. Like outside of my public life, I work in corporate America, like in human resources. And so 
I understand like diversity, equity, inclusion is a real thing. And why do you have it? Is because if you have folks from the same background and same experience, you're going to get the same type of thoughts and same ideas and the same outcomes. Like it's just a group thing type of a thing. You cannot avoid it. And even if you have folks who have generally different ideas about problem solving, eventually your learned experiences are going to bring you to the same place. And it's just sociology. It's just how things work. And so this is why having a team of diversity, like when they did that, that what if with, with miles, like they should have just literally called up any black person they knew and was like, Hey, listen to this. And it would have stopped immediately. It would have never gotten out of the room. Like no matter what, like it, it, and I think that's what they have to do. Like they have to have the leads as people from that community, but then fill in because guess what? Each one teach one because what happens is that team understands from those folks how to view things and it helps, it helps everybody grow. So, yeah, I think they should do it, but I think they should diversify those teams. Yeah. 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 Cool. 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 Costly, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. What's your opinion on the comic codes of America? Do you think it will all hurt or help the comic book industry in general after it first came out? Uh, because from what I read, like what comic books were wildly popular, like even in World War II, but then it, after the comics codes of America, I mean, it got a negative rasp. Yeah, uh, because of some psychologists that said, "Oh, it, it was worse than Hitler." Comic yeah. books, yeah. And then uh, what's it called? Comics code of America hurt, and everything got tamer until I would say the 1990s and 2000s. Yeah, and even DC abandoned uh, the comic codes of America back in 2011, I believe. Yeah, I, I think here's the thing, and, and I'm someone who's a firm believer in that. There's a there's a positive role that government can play, but there's just some things that government shouldn't do. And I think one of the things is regulating art and free speech to a degree where you try to drive a message. Um, and I think that's what happened with the comic codes. It's like, Hey, we need this nationalism. We need to, we need to make this homogenous message that comes out of all, um, all comics. And what happens is folks are turned off by that because guess what? If I don't feel that way, I'm not going to read that. If I feel like I'm being manipulated, I'm not going to read that. If I feel like you're trying to indoctrinate me, I'm going to reject it. And so I think one of the things that we have to do is this is the this is the last kind of the bastion of creativity. This is where you should be able to have the imagination to imagine anything. And so when you get into a point where you're saying that a comic has to check this box, this box and this box, then you what you do is you limit the creativity and the imagination of the authors and the writers. And so for me, I think it was heavy handed. And I think whatever mission that they had with the comic codes, it it, it wasn't for the benefit of the genre or, or the community. And I think it almost killed the comic industry. So I, I, I don't I'm not a supporter of that because I think um, art and artists, um, they should be guided by creativity and not necessarily someone telling them uh, what they have to say in the message. Final question. Sure. Do you think there would ever be a non-straight Superman if the comic code was still being followed by DC? No, you think no, it would no, be no, 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 not, not, a, not, not a chance, not a chance. <laughs> I mean, think about this. We just went from truth, justice in American way to truth, justice and a better tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Like, and what happened? Literally meltdown across the spectrum. Like you hate America, like you're like you're a commie because you want to. And like to me, Superman is, um, you know, I always say this and, and folks get mad at me when I talk about Superman. And he's my he's my favorite character to this day. But Superman is an illegal immigrant who had an anchor baby who just turned out to be gay. Like you, you think about it, like seriously, he's an illegal immigrant. He came here. He didn't have any papers. Um, he was he he was taken in. He married uh, an, an Earth woman. And he had an anchor baby. And so, you know, he's a DACA kid. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, you know, so so he's he's everything that a lot of people hate. But you put him forward because he presents as a very powerful white male. And so that's why I think um, when you try to change Superman, it's almost like you're trying to change America. You know, it's like when you criticize Superman, it's like you're criticizing America. And I love him. But. You know, he's the archetype of what we are like, you know, um, we see ourselves as Superman, but the rest of the world sees us as Homelander. 
you know? Like, and so we got to deal. Like, we got to deal. Yeah. Like, we got to like we gotta deal with that. Like, we got to deal with that. But thank you for the question. Great question. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about um, really the role of companies when it comes to uh, both promoting progressive ideas, but also uh, capitalizing on them. For example, Disney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a Black Little Mermaid. Sure. We're going to have a Hispanic Snow White. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to Marvel, uh, they uh, fired like Pearl Marduk, who was one of the main people yep. who was getting in the way of uh, making the Black Panther mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Black Widow movies. But at the same time, you have. Uh, what Bob Iger said recently about uh, the writer strike and the actor strike. So, when it comes to uh, getting these progressive ideas out of inclusiveness and uh, diversity, uh, and yet there's still sort of the, the dark aspect of they're still about the money and, and making sure that the bottom line is what's important. Yeah, I, and I, I think I think in a lot of ways, um, and we we just recently saw. Like we saw backlash when companies try to expand their markets, right? You saw the Bud Light controversy with the trans person on the can. Like it was like, did you think it was gonna turn you gay when you sipped it? Like, like, like that's that's kind of dumb. Like you've been drinking that beer for forever, and you think just because the trans person is on the on the can is gonna it's gonna affect you. But you saw the you saw the the backlash to that because there's certain things where folks believe that it's forced, right? And instead of accepting uh, the idea that trans people exist in our society and deserve to be seen, it's almost like you're forcing this thing down my throat. But companies understand that, um, you know, being being closed off hurts your bottom line, like because you're, you're segregating large parts of the population that you can make money from. So it's not really progress and progressive ideals in the sense of being progressive, it's more like I need more people to sell stuff to. So I'm going to open up the markets to, so I can get a larger market share of folks coming in. And so um, I think they, in some degrees, it works out, right? And then some degree, really hurt, but like already so fixed. Like, you know, liberals doesn't really drink Bud Light, you know? And so you you had a captive audience. And so when they tried to do that, it back, backfired. But you look at things like Dick Sporting Goods when they stopped carrying shotguns, their stock went up. When you look at, um, you know, Nike when they stood behind Colin Kaepernick, their stock went up. When you look at, uh, you know, Keurig and folks who did Pride, you know, those th- their stock went up. Why? Because they had a broader audience and folks felt included in their marketing campaign. So progress, yes, but I think it's also just really just good business. Because the more the more people that you open up your market to, the more opportunity you have to to, to make money. And so, uh, it's, I don't know if it's an altruistic, like benevolent type of a, a move, but hey, what else, whatever gets us there gets us there, right? And so, the more times that we can have people out in our community that feel seen and represented, and and have opportunities um, to to be seen and represented, I think the better. And however we get there, I think it's cool. Thank you. Yeah. like to say uh i don't normally go to these things yeah i've learned a lot actually oh great I, I great really, it's really been i guess helpful to see it from a different perspective than sure. I normally do my first sure day. um but i was wondering um what your specific thoughts were about the uh color changing of specific stories that have to do with specifically like white culture mm-hmm. such as uh recently in the news it came out that the actress that's going to play astrid in yeah. the new uh how to train your dragon movie mm-hmm. is going to be i can't remember if it was mixed or just yeah. black um but i was wondering what your thoughts were specifically as like the norse um yeah. that whole area and traditionally is yeah. very uh white yeah it, and i i think to some degree because because you know you know you had valkyrie right mm-hmm. like valkyrie yeah. was changed tessa thompson played valkyrie and I don't think anybody, and then, you know, Heimdall was yeah. yourself. So you, I, I think it's just really kind of dramatic license. And I think if you say, um, you know, cause, cause you can't really think about like Wakanda and think that you're going to see like, you know, very blonde haired, blue eyed yeah. people yeah. running through Wakanda. Yeah. And so that's just not really a thing. And so I think there's some, uh, I think you do have some abilities to make sure that 
you are as accurate as possible. Okay. And I and so I don't think anybody would really be up in arms if you didn't change how to train your dragon. Like I don't think anybody would. And I think, you know, depending on what they were looking for from the range of the actress, maybe whoever auditioned for that was the best actor. Yeah. Like the like the casting director for uh, Little Mermaid said, Halle Bailey walked in first and they really could have sent everyone else home because she walked in and the first time a note came out of her mouth, they was like, that's it. Yeah. And so she just happened to be, you know, a very caramel colored, you know, yeah. Young, yeah. young woman. And so I think if you're if you're casting the best actress um, or actor, I think that is one thing. But if you're just trying to say, I'm going to find someone to update and modernize this, modernize the story. I think you have to look at the story overall and see, does it really fit? Because if you don't, if you don't have more than just her, then it looks forced. Yeah. And so I think that's the thing, like the environment of the movie has to be reflective of a change. Like you look at, you look at Asgard and in the Marvel films, like it's, it's diverse. It's diverse. So it wasn't a stretch when Tessa Thompson played Valkyrie because you look around through the, through the city of Asgard and it's diverse. And so nobody really had a big idea, but if you have, you know, one Brown actress in a sea of blonde Vikings, then you're going to have, then it's going to feel forced to everyone. And I don't think you accomplish the goal that you're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Um, so you talked about it a second ago, mm-hmm. um, and I don't feel super, super qualified to talk about this, but um, then, then you fit in with every politician that exists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so black role models for mm-hmm. like black kids in America. Um, and pretty much everywhere, actually, in comics. Yeah. Um, I'd say right now the main one that comes to mind when people think about that is Miles, just because sure. of the stuff that's happened recently. He's become a lot more popular. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that even with his like uh, his Venom blast, I think is what he yeah. calls it most yeah. of the time, that's an electric power. That's trying to, <laughs> that's grouping him in with all that. But do you feel like even with that, yeah. um, he keeps enough uniqueness, and do you think that he is a good role model for that? And adding on to that, if not... Um, is there somebody better? Is there somebody that you would recommend to a kid that wants to start getting into comic books yeah. um, that you could, like, just a character you'd be able to point out? That yeah, I, I think Bert, I think um, I think Miles is great. I think Miles is I think Miles is great because you know he has a unique set of of skills, like his his abilities to be become invisible. Yeah, the Venom Blast is kind of stereotypical, but hey, but look, it's a power set that traditionally. Peter Parker didn't have. Right. And so I think that gives him some delineation away from the original character. But like you think about how far you go with like Miguel O'Hara in, in 2099, like that guy's a beast, man. Like like speed, strength, the Shoulders. show, the venom, <laughs> these fangs like this guy's a beast. Like in, and he's a Hispanic, you know, Afro Hispanic guy. And so, um, yeah. So I think as long as you make some effort to, to show some distinction between the characters, I think it's fine. I think Miles is a great character. Uh, I would always recommend someone to check out Virgil Hawkins' Static Shock. If you're going to get into it, yeah. If you're going to get it, if, you, if you're a young black kid and you want to get into that, you really start with Static Shock. And I'm so glad that um, we're going to get some material uh, coming from there. Jaime Reyes' is Blue Beetles coming out. Uh, so I think that's going to be fantastic. I'm, I can't wait. So there's some really cool um, young people to be able to get behind that show representation positively. Um, and I think, you know, Miles has a great family structure. Jaime has a great family structure. And so I think that's a really cool place to start if you're looking, if young kids are looking for role models. And yeah. even with, uh, like, but you mean most main Miles, not the what if. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, yeah, like, honestly, like, if I ever see the the, the folks who wrote that, like, they're going to catch hands, like, on site. <laughs> Like we we're going like it's it's on site, man. Like you like you really did because honestly, I love Thor too. Like I love Thor. Like I, I really love what they what where they've gone with Thor now with with you know the All Father, all you know, Odin Force and and Power Cosmic and and he's like OP with the Venom with uh, the Phoenix Force and everything. I love that. Like I love seeing characters like reach a crazy OP level. Like Action Comics ten fifty. Like Superman come back come come back from War World and he's and he's juiced and I've been fighting for that for years because I feel like they nerfed him. 
but but I love that. But this that guy, like that, what if Miles, like that's got to go. Like he's not worthy. So he like he needs to put the hammer down. Like whatever. So he's but, a good role model in the right situation. Yeah, in the right situation, I think if you guys see the Spider Verse movies, like that Miles um, is a really really good role model. He's respectful of his parents. He's really um, he's really about his community. He takes his job and his role with Spider-Man seriously. He really honors his mentor uh, and the legacy that Peter left. And I think um, those are those are values. Those are core values. And that's one of the things of the underpinnings that should cut through the toxicity of politics is that there's a core values to in politics. There's there's justice and there's 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 um, helping out those who are weaker. Like that's what heroes are supposed to do. And they're not bullies and they're not, you know, imperialists or anything like that, um, even though they do go into other people's countries without asking. Uh, but but, you know, but it's to help people it's for, for good reasons. And so those are the core values that I, I can't um, for the life of me understand that how it got so consumed in this toxic, toxic mess that we're in right now, because this should be this should be the space where we can have a conversation like we're having tonight. And our personal beliefs come into it. We just go back and forth about what we feel about the best thing about the character. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 See, we talk, look, we talk miles up. Look. Yeah. See? Not up here to talk about a paper. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So it's kind of a loaded question. Sure. But, um, uh, the X-Men have just recently had, like, you know, they got Kakoa going oh, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, they just recently had a shakeup in, like, the past week's issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people did not like how they handled it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people have been asking for uh, more diversity in the X-Men team, yeah. and they finally get diversity, mm-hmm. and something yeah. happened, right? Yeah. So, um, in your opinion, um, how do you feel like the X-Men can be handled to where – because it's – widely known that they're like an allegory for yep. POCs yep. and you know how do they get to a place where their more famous stories and their more like more infamous stories aren't solely about like you know bigotry and yeah. always having to you know get because you know they have the resurrection thing now mm-hmm. but I kind of feel like some of the writers are using it as a tool to be like okay we can kill off yep boom 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 and then not do anything so. yeah I, I think in a I think what happens is when you have um, when you have a title that's so steeped and it's so inter- intertwined with like a societal uh, societal issue, like sometimes you feel like you can do almost anything with that and that anything's acceptable because folks understand what that means. Um, but what they miss is that folks don't always understand what that means. Yeah. And so like Krakoa is one of those things, like we're having this national debate about reparations, right? Like we're having this debate about how do we make communities that suffered whole? And like one of the things that was promised, uh, you know, after the Civil War was like 40 acres and a mule, like give me this land back so that we can make the best of what we we wanted. So there was this idea that we were going to integrate and society was going to be great and it didn't happen. And so um, if you look at how, and honestly, like a lot of folks will always have this thing that, um, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were allegories for Professor, for Professor X and Magneto, yep. right? Absolutely. And so how do we have this peaceful integration and or we have separate but equal? Right. And I think there was this idea with Krakoa that, hey, we, we gave it our level best. Humans are just not going to accept us. And so we got to go off and do our own thing. Yeah. But you got to understand is that power is one of those things that can up in anything. And so the struggle within internally and like you have debates within the black community about things like reparations. Some folks say we don't want it. And the other folks say, yeah, we need it. People are not a monolith. The mutants, even though they're, they're different from humans, are not a monolith. And so I think when you're trying to write things like that, like you have to be able to cover the spectrum of how people feel. And I think that arc started off really strong. Yeah, yeah. And they tried, they tried to do something because, you know, you do have popular characters. It's all good, bro. Um, and so you have, like, folks who are demanding things like, oh, I'd love to see this character. I love, 
and you have an outcry. And so you try to fix everything, but you can't do it without destroying the integrity of yeah. the story. And so what happens is it takes about one page or one yep. half of a book to ruin the experience of like a I really said, super, just happened, yeah. yeah, it just happened in ruin. And now you can't think about how great the other, you know, 10 or so issues were. Mm -hmm. You think about how bad this one ends. And yep. so I think honestly, the continuity between the writers, that's something that you also have to think about yeah. as well, because that writer, another writer can come on and take it in a completely different way. Like honestly, uh, recently, um, I, I forget his name. He he did a run of Black Panther, oh and God, and it was Ridley. yeah John yes yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it was so bad in how they so portrayed bad. how they portrayed T'Challa and so it's you know this guy is like persona non grata in the community because it's like you really really took down a bad. pivotal character in, in the community and so it's really about the writer and how they For see sure. because if not then you can really lose yeah. your audience yeah. absolutely yeah. Thank you. yeah of course yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, folks, I, I, I don't. I think it's ten o'clock. I don't know what time this is in. I, I, hey, like I'm like Cap. I can do this all day. Uh, but I, the next panel, you're good. Ten, ten o'clock. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you a hard question. Are we good with that? Yeah. Okay. So I suppose that you would be fully in support of like interracial couples and comics and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I know I will be. I, I come from an interracial sure. couple. Um, and one day I think that our world is going to exist with everyone looking like a beautiful tan, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so would you have an issue as Wakanda becomes more integrated into the world if you have an interracial relationship that produces a child that one day rules Wakanda and that child looks white? Yeah, um, I, I don't have a problem. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Um, I think the... I think the issue would be, um, I think the issue would be maybe amongst the tribes. Like, I, I think you would have like maybe that outside. I mean, because you know, thing you think about it, like you've got Hunter in there, you've got the White Wolf, you've got him. He's part of the ro the royal family, right? And so, you know, if all else fails, if all, every member of the royal family dies, Hunter becomes the new Black Panther, and he's white. And so, I think in that regard, I don't think there would be an issue. Um, but I do think when you talk about protectionism and you talk about xenophobia and you talk about those those things, I think um, Wakanda Forever was a perfect allegory of xenophobia and protectionism when it comes to like geopolitics, right? Like you've got these two powerful nations that don't want to don't want to be bothered because they understand how dangerous it is um, to 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 have the outside world infiltrate that. And so um, they stay separate and, and to themselves. I think I don't think because of vibranium uh, and the power that it is, you you would see that. But I I certainly don't. Um, I certainly would be against you know Shuri having a interracial relationship and then having a baby or T'Challa remarrying. Uh, even though I would cry, cry, cry tears uh, that he's not with Storm. Uh, but I wouldn't be a I wouldn't have a problem with that. I just think that. It would be, um, I think it would be a tough sale to to the public. Sure, for sure. But yeah, that, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, and that's, like, and that's it shouldn't be a tough sale. No, it shouldn't. You know, you're absolutely right. It should not be a tough sale. But I think when we when we talk about it, on either side of the issue, there's a certain purity aspect that folks, and I hate that word. There's a certain purity aspect that folks want to keep with particular characters. Um, but it goes down way easier on one side than it, it goes on the other. And it and it does. And I think I think what happens is um, when we talk when I when I talked earlier about like there's certain characters that you just can't you should not mess with their origin. And I talked about Magneto. I think T'Challa and, and Wakanda are some of those characters where the origin is so pivotal to what the character is that you can't really mess with that. But that has nothing to do with generations upon generations that happened after that. So I wouldn't be mad at it, but I don't think, I do think some of those saying that pendulum can swing both ways and it would be a tough sale to the public. Yeah. Um, any other questions, guys? Hey, come on, come on. I think we got a few minutes. No, you're good. You're good. 
everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Alonzo. Um, and I just had a question about, um, we kind of mentioned um, that, uh, like, an allegory for um, mutants would be, you know, race. Mm-hmm. Or uh, and another example would be, like, Zootopia. Sure. Or for the predators would be, you know, the black people. Yeah, in society. yeah. Um, do you feel that that's an apt comparison? Because, like, when you consider mutants, like, mutants are actually a threat, right? They actually have powers. Mm-hmm. Some of them can, you know, the anything, entire anything, universe. Yes, yeah, anything. You know, yeah. With the predators with Zootopia, they actually hunt prey. You yeah. know what I mean? They're an actual threat. So do you think that that's an apt comparison? Um, I think anytime where you have a concentration of power, that's seen as predatory. Whether that's political power or whether that's wealth or whether that's physical manifestations of, of race. Like if you are seen as powerful, you're seen as a threat. And so I think what's happened is um, because if you either set someone up as powerful to use them for their own end, or you set someone up as powerful so that you can have machinations to control them. And so one of the things that you do is you can scare people by saying, oh, look at this, you know, very powerful mutant who can just walk into your house and take anything from you. We've got to control that person. And that was done to black people after slavery. And it was and it was done to justify brutality. So when you think about the race massacres that happened in this country, it happened because they set black people up as predators. There was either a white woman or something that was accusing someone of of physical assault that justified the culling of neighborhoods like Tulsa and Rosewood, Florida. In, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and places like that, because they set this person up as powerful. Like, look at how they describe like black athletes. You know, he's look, he's he's a beast. He's you know, oh, he's an animal. He's got that dog in him. But then you look at how they describe you know describe white athletes. Oh, he's heady and he's scrappy and he's you know he's and it's it's a very different thing. And it's like one denotes power, the other denotes intellect. And so you have these two. You have these two this juxtaposition between the two. And um, sometimes people feel justified in treating one one way and treating one another. And so I think when you have that dichotomy in uh, in comic books, um, I think that's how the Friends of Humanity, that's how, you know, Trask and Stryker, yeah. that's why, you know, they went and got Tony, Tony Stark to help with the Sentinels because we've got to have something powerful enough to be able to stand against these mutants. Because if not, they're going to overrun us. And so it's either I'm going to set you up as powerful to use you to, for your own end, or I'm going to set you up as powerful to control you by making people fear. Right. Yeah. 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 I had um, a question. So sure. a, lot of, a lot of the talk that's been going on has been um, about uh, race mm-hmm. and the allegories behind uh, race and race swapping. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking how it related to a comic that I read, uh, The Visions. Yeah. Uh, and how many of the scenes in the comic uh, depicted what I want to call racism. Yeah. If that's even the correct yeah. word <laughs> because of the context. Certainly. Um, and specifically the fact that uh, within the comic, you could see that people of all races united in the treatment that was portrayed to the vision. Yeah. Family. Yeah. I, I wanted to, to ask for your thoughts. What do you think causes that, that kind of vicious cycle? Yeah. So, so here's the thing. I think, I think if we, if there's someone that's so different and someone that's so outside of the full traditional aspect of what a group is like there's a there's a certain human we're, this is a very diverse room right we're we're different ages we're different races we're different sexes we're different heights colors everything but we all mostly have two eyes and 10 fingers and 10 toes and like we're we're human right so when you have something that's far outside of that that's a galvanizing force like the friends of humanity was a very diverse group like, you know, like they were very diverse, but they hated mutants. Why? Mutants had that one thing that separated them from humanity. The visions, androids, you know, whatever it may be, um, 
they were not human. And so it was able to galvanize all of humanity, even over their differences against them. Like there's nothing that this country loves more than an out group. We love to hate that group. Right. And so you see it even now when you talk about the LGBT community, it unites those in the faith community. Like it can be Southern Baptist or it can be, um, you know, you know, black um, uh, African, you know, African-American Episcopals, it unites them against the LGBT community. So um, a lot of times those individual, those similarities, if you have something that's so out, outside the mainstream, it will unite them against that person. That's what happened with divisions. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm over time. I'm done guys, but guys, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for this guys. I really appreciate it. Um, my first time ever. So I really appreciate you guys being kind. Um, Hey. What's going on, True Believers? Thank you for your continued and growing support. Uh, if you're enjoying the content that we're producing here on Superhero Politics, I ask that you subscribe anywhere that you can find podcasts. That means iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Uh, you can find us at Buzzsprout uh, and also on our social media at Superhero Politics on Twitter at Superhero Politics on Facebook, Superhero Politics on Instagram, and Superhero Politics on TikTok. Um, like, share, join us. And if you would have any uh, topics that you would like to share or just questions that you would like to ask me, uh, you can send your emails to SuperheroPolitics at gmail.com and uh, we'll do an episode where we answer your questions. Thank you for your continued support. And remember, always speak truth to power.